This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Jack Kevorkian has one more house call. The game mercifully euthanized. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Tim Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Present and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace, and if it seems like I'm relieved, it's because I am. The game is officially off. 2020's first act of mercy. Michigan down something like 40 players or something on the roster because of COVID and contact tracing. Won't be able to play the game. Sorry, we won't be able to provide you Ohio State fans your perennial satisfaction of ripping our scrotums off in front of a nationally televised audience. I guess you'll just have to pick on somebody else this weekend, maybe Maryland or somebody else that's available to play. On the other hand, this is probably the biggest win of the Jim Harbaugh era. At least it'll be the first time he's ever denied Ohio State a Big Ten championship until the Big Ten votes to change its rules to let Ohio State play for a Big Ten championship. But we'll get to all of that and the black tar that is my cotton-picking maize and blue soul at the moment when Mark Rogers joins us uh, for the 10-Minute War. To lead off this week's episode, however, I thought it might be fun to take questions from other people suffering just like me, fellow Michigan fans. And it's our first ever Ask Me Anything here on Michigan Podcast. Let us begin. This question is from the Iron Wolverine, who says, If Jim Harbaugh stays, what can we expect for 2021 in terms of record and recruiting. If Jim Harbaugh stays, Iron Wolverine, the forecast for 2021, pain. In all seriousness, pain. And they'll have some top 15 recruiting class and lose at, three, lose at least three games, accomplish nothing of any significance, and get absolutely blitzkrieged, sodomized, prison assaulted the last game of the season. I, I think we've all... Am I the only one that's watched this thing the uh, last few years? So I kind of feel like that question was asked and answered, Your Honor. Next, Brad G says, can you just tell I'm really nihil? I'm sorry, uh, optimistic. I almost said nihilist. Brad G says, when will Ward Manuel, that's Michigan's AD, realize enough is enough? A little Brian Greasy play on words there, Brad. I see what you did. Michigan's lone living national championship former quarterback tweeting out is enough is enough. After the Penn State debacle a couple of weeks back, I think Ward Manuel actually knows it now. I, I Now, at the time we're taping this, who knows, this may get resolved by the time we're done. But from what I am being told, 
And John U. Bacon seemed to confirm this from the Harbaugh side of things on Monday night. From what I am being told is Ward Manuel has not has offered Jim Harbaugh a lower salary incentive laden deal that's basically a, a demerit. It's a recognition that you have failed this city, Green Arrow, and that Jim is mulling whether to take that uh, boost or that bruise to the ego and swallow his pride and try to fix the situation that he wrecked. Uh, you know, in the 1997 Iowa game, Brian Greasy threw a couple of terrible interceptions. Michigan was down 21 to seven at the half. Lloyd Carr famously walked up to Greasy in the locker room in front of his teammates and said, Hey, Brian, you, you, you made this mess in the second half. You go out there and clean it up. All right. And he led the comeback for Michigan at the end of that game. Well, that is kind of what Ward is saying here to Jim Harbaugh. Hey, if you want to stay here, you made this mess. You wrecked this thing. You got to fix it. Yeah. One year to fix it. And you're getting an incentive laden deal to indicate that you've got to fix this right now. And then if you don't want to fix it, you if you have all these NFL offers and jobs you claim to have, by golly, good luck to you. God bless you on the way out. Appreciate your time here. So I do think that Ward has kind of figured it out. I do. And then we'll just see what Jim Harbaugh does from here. Next, Brandon Beery says, what is the ceiling for the 2021 Michigan men's basketball team? Oh, yes. Finally, I get asked a question about a Michigan team whose players love their coach. I think... The ceiling for this team comes down to defense because offensively, I think this is the deepest, most gifted Michigan basketball team in several years, probably since the 2014 team when they won the Big Ten championship with Nick Stauskas, Big Ten player of the year. You had Glenn Robinson, the third on that team, Derek Walton, Karis LeVert, et cetera. The offensive depth and versatility on this squad is really something. And and you're some of your best playmakers coming off the bench. I I like Hunter Dickinson actually coming off the bench, provided you don't leave him there for eight minutes like you did to start the Central Florida game. But I like the jolt that he gives you. I love the jolt that Shondi Brown gives you off the bench. When you look at the depth and depth of scores and offensive versatility, where you could even you could play Franz Wagner anywhere from the five if you want to go small, all the way to the two if you want to go large. I think they're going to be a tough matchup. Now, defensively, though, I don't see a lot of plus defenders on this team. We've seen at times Eli Brooks can be a plus defender. I think Shondi Brown could be a plus defender. It's kind of early yet, and and he come he's not had a chance to go through yet the uh, the rigors of the Big Ten. That'll change starting this weekend with Penn State. But there's not a lot of plus defenders. They overplay too much in, on a stationary defense and give up easy dribble drives as a result. They've got some work to do on the defensive end. Their, their talent, depth, and firepower is enough to get to the NCAA tournament just on that. The ceiling is going to be determined by how much better they get defensively the rest of the season. I think that's the ceiling for this team. If, if they become adequate to good defensively, I think you have, with the right kind of draw, Michigan's like you know 30 teams in college basketball. With the right draw, they could make a Final Four. But if they, if they don't improve defensively, they could be a team that is a first weekend upset bid you know, disappointment. So I, I think the, the ceiling for Michigan basketball is going to be determined by the commitment to defense because the offensive skill, talent, and depth, and flexibility is there. Our next question comes from Andrew Fiorita who says, what positives and negatives do you see coming from the name, image, and likeness inclusion in the upcoming seasons? I think the big negative is that they're trying to regulate it. I don't know why the NCAA or even universities or conferences view themselves as called to be intermediaries in negotiating contracts for adults or what an adult can contract or not. We have, we have agencies that do that. The law the IRS, et cetera. I think if you're going to do name, image, and likeness, there isn't any regulation. Well, Steve, you'll just have schools give players a hundred grand to go to school. They're already doing that. But now they all become taxable events. And when you get rid of a black market and go to an open market, prices always go down. See, the reason things cost so much in a black market is there's a cost of doing business there because of the inherent risk of getting caught, getting busted. When you go to a free market, now everybody feels like they can openly compete in an open market against something. And these things all become taxable events. Anytime you tax something, you get less of it. It won't be a hundred grand. It's a hundred grand right now because they're under the table black market payments. I wouldn't regulate it at all. I would just say, hey, you know, you're an adult. You can't use our, we have our own brand, our own name, image, and likeness. You can't use that to market you. But whatever you do to market you is a you problem. Just make sure you got an accountant and an attorney because if you don't, the IRS 
knocking at the door, you know, but hello, Wesley Snipes and Willie Nelson. Other than that, not our problem. That's what I would do. The negative comes from, I don't think at first they're going to do that. Bureaucrats going to bureaucrat. And I am concerned that they are going to muck this up in that process. And that's why I have a hard time giving you too many positives because I'm, I'm not sure how debilitating their attempts at regulation are going to be. Our next question, Tiberius Menx asks, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is Noah, that's my, that's my boy, that's my son, is Noah still a Michigan fan or has he jumped ship? I have lost my son to my wife's favorite team, Ohio State. Yes, Noah is still a big Michigan fan. I just can't get him to watch the games very much anymore. He tends to bail at the first sign of adversity, you know, kind of like the team. We continue on with our Ask Me Anything. Christopher Albia says, what is the bare minimum you would tolerate from a Michigan coach? 40% win rate against Ohio State and 9 to 10 wins a year. Yeah. I mean, that should be a bare minimum. And you got to have won at least a Big Ten championship in five years. One. One. Hell, I don't even know why I'm talking about winning a Big Ten championship. Can you win the division once in five years? Can you do that? Can you do that? So it's not even just the amount of wins, but there has to be some significance in there. We've got to be competitive against Ohio State. That means, hey, in a course of five years, winning once or twice, minimum. We have to be winning Big Ten championships, which means we're winning a Big Ten championship, the Big Ten East, minimum, once every four or five years, minimum. Yeah, that's the bare minimum. I think you articulated a good standard there. And those are standards that Jim Harbaugh has not met. It's sad. I hate it. I'm not happy about it. It's my favorite player from my youth. But, you know, I often look in the mirror and I'm not happy with it. But it is what it is. Yeah, the the truth is what it is. Whether you're happy with it or not, it's still the truth. All right, let's continue. We have Nate Asper next who says, hey, Michigan hasn't had a skill position player drafted in the first round of the NFL since Braylon Edwards after the 2004 season. Is this a problem with recruiting, player development, or both? Yes. And if you, if you need to know any stat that perfectly articulates Michigan's fall, it's that one right there. Not since 2004, that's the 05 draft, has Michigan had a player, a skill player, picked in the first round of the NFL, which, not coincidentally, is the last time that season, 2004, they won a Big Ten championship. Shared it with Iowa that year, went out to the Rose Bowl, played a great game against Vince Young in Texas, lost in the final seconds. There's a direct correlation there. Look at the skill position talent that Ohio State has. Look at the skill position talent that Michigan has. Look at the skill position talent Penn State had with McSorley and Saquon Barkley. When was the last time Michigan had anything close to a duo like that? So yeah, you nailed it, brother. That's absolutely the root of the problem right there. I believe we have one more. Two more. Okay. This is from Mr. Morals. I like that name. Is Jim Tressel coming to Ohio State the biggest moment in the game's rivalry? Everyone talks about Urban's years, but Ohio State is 17 to 3 or 17 and 3 in the last 20 years. That was the last big moment in the games in the, in the game uh, in the history of the game. Yeah, I agree with that. The previous turning point was 1969 with Bo's arrival in Ann Arbor that changed the rivalry and that year Michigan went on to upset Ohio State number one in the country, and Woody Hayes would say later on, the best team he ever had. The next turning point was the hiring of Jim Tressel, and then the fact they went to Ann Arbor and did win that game in 2001. December 30th, 2014 was supposed to be the most recent turning point in the history of the rivalry, but unfortunately that one hasn't worked out. All right, this question is the last one we're going to tackle here. JS writes, if Jim Harbaugh is renewed with an understanding that it's next year or bust, In looking at the current roster, the expected transfers in the incoming class, is it reasonable to expect a championship season, or is this just another attempt at a more amicable exit plan? And if that's the and if that's true, what will be lost in terms of available options right now? That is an excellent question, JS. There's a variable though in answering it that we have to account for that we can't right now. And that is the transfer portal. Let's say, for example, Mackenzie Milton, remember him? The phenomenal quarterback at Central Florida had that gruesome leg injury a couple of years ago. Let's say he can play, and he's he's back to 100%, and he goes to Michigan. That changes something. It still probably doesn't beat Ohio State, but 
a healthy Mackenzie Milton, if he's anything close to what he was in 2017 and 2018, if he's anything close to that, then that absolutely ups your ceiling. Whether it's enough to compete against the Buckeyes, I doubt, but it certainly improves your prospects. And the transfer portal is going to work both ways this year. Michigan is going to have some attrition, whether Harbaugh stays or goes. But you're going to be able to bring guys in as well. Let's say you hire a new coach who has an accomplished quarterback that wants to go with him. That changes things. Your ability to, hey, you know what? Tulsa this year has a linebacker that could have been that could be an All-American. Now, he's probably going to the NFL. But what if you brought him in? And he thought, hey, I'll go play in Michigan. I got a chance to you know play on national TV. I can't do that at Tulsa very often. And so I, I think we have to consider, you see this in college basketball right now, where teams are able to remake their rosters on the fly, you know, via the transfer portal. I've se- I, I watched Fred Hoiberg do this quite a bit with transfers at Iowa State a few years ago. And so I think we have to account for that. Look at Rutgers. Two things they've done to make themselves competent. The hiring of Greg Schiano and then the rating of the transfer portal. Last year, Illinois used the rating of the transfer portal to go from Levy Smith, that's dead man walking, to go into a bowl game for the first time in five years. So the transfer portal changes things. You look at Jim Harbaugh's first year, the acquisition of Jake Rudock. What happens if they don't have him that year? Do they go 10 and 3? Probably not. So I think we have to find out who comes through the entrance side of the transfer portal before we can ask your question, but it's a good one. All right, let's talk about the game. It's been canceled, mercifully. And what does it mean about the future of the rivalry? We'll get into that with Mark Rogers in the 10-Minute War next. We get asked all the time here on Michigan Podcast, hey, what can we do to support you guys? Well, you can support us via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. You don't just support us, you get exclusive content there, including handicapping picks, exclusive podcasts, and other things available to you by supporting us on our Patreon page. And who knows, you might make some money. Uh, It looks like all my NFL season win total best bets are going to cash this year. So check us out, patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And thanks to the hundreds of you that are supporting us right now at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And now let's get to our 10 minute war as finally the year 2020 has decided indeed to include some form of mercy. It is the season for acts of mercy. Nonetheless, The game, Michigan-Ohio State, will not be played this year. Now, it wasn't going to be played at my house anyway. I'm out. I've been telling you that for a year. I was really struggling with what I was going to do, though, because prior to the season being canceled and then delayed for a start, I was going to go see Kong versus Godzilla at the movies, but then that got delayed till next year. I did just find out that my local IMAX is doing the Polar Express in 3D, So on the off chance that Michigan was going to play Saturday, I never believed for a second they were. But on the off chance I was wrong, I was going to get tickets and go see that. I'm I'm not watching. I don't care about this game, the rivalry. It doesn't exist anymore. I love talking about the history of it, but on a contemporary level, this thing is dead to me until either there's a new coach at Michigan or Michigan actually wins the game. I'm guessing, though, our 10-minute war guest each week, Mark Rogers, Devoted Ohio State fan has a slightly different opinion as he joins us in his not Troy Smith, but Art Schleister throwback autographed jersey. Mark, good to see you, brother. How are you? I'm doing well, Steve. I would be doing much better if there was a the game scheduled at noon as it customarily is and should be on Saturday. Did you have something to do with this? I didn't. Here, here's what I'm pretty confident because I've been trailing, I've been telling people all week they're not playing the game. Well, I mean, they're practicing. They're not playing. They're practicing. No, they're not. There's a pre- they're not playing the game. Here is what I'm pretty confident based on people I've talked to happened here. Michigan has serious COVID issues. It has had a remarkable negative testing percentage, one of the best in college football for months. But you've seen this really since around Halloween at a lot of places. You know, the you're you're out of the championship race. What are we doing here? You know what I'm saying? And not seeing my girlfriend, not going anywhere on campus, taking that stupid nasal swab every day, start gets a little bit old. And I think that's what happened here with Michigan. 
is after the Penn State game, it was pretty obvious, or, or and, and frankly, it was obvious during it, Michigan's not interested in playing football anymore this season. And I just think that the, the, the protocol wall broke. This thing would have been canceled many days ago already, except for Kirk Herbstreet's comments. That angered Michigan, which I think is a joke as well. Herbstreet was only saying what a lot of Michigan fans were saying on Michigan message boards. There's one Michigan website where people were trashing Kirk Herbstreet for saying what one of the insiders on the website had already posted earlier in the day. Hey, let's just get out of this season. I'm all for it, by the way. But when Herbstreet made his comments, there was a portion of the Michigan fan base that were angered by that, particularly coming from a Buckeye. Uh, Ward Manuel came out from underneath uh, whatever spider hole he hides these days, the Michigan AD, to do a an interview with a spokesperson for the university calling Kirk Herbstreet foolish. And so I think these last few days have just been optics. They were never going to play. They can't play. I mean, I've been told they're well under 50 scholarship players right now because of all the positives and contact tracing. So I think this thing would have been canceled a while ago. It's just after Herb Street's comments. Now we're going to go through the optics of, yeah, we'll play them in any way, shape, or form. I, that's all politics. And uh, Michigan's not faking COVID. The fake was acting as if it was going to play this week. That was the fake, in my opinion. Your thoughts? I had my hopes. I certainly had my hopes. And we've seen uh, the Big Ten push through with the number of games that were threatened early in the week and we heard things about. But, of course, once Michigan and Maryland was canceled, we knew what the situation at the University of Michigan was. So you still feel better about missing this game, the game, than going out there and losing by 50. Oh, without question. The okay. same way that an ant feels better about falling into a crack in a sidewalk than meeting a boot. All right. I mean, the, the same way that a nail feels better when you hit your thumb than when the hammer hits it. I, I, this isn't competitive. I don't, I mean, the idea, where's the competitor in you? I mean, I don't know. I mean, Mount Kilimanjaro, I'm competitive as they get. I know I can't climb it. So what is the point? Michigan isn't serious about this. It's just not. It's just, and you, you can watch the way they played football all year long, the way that they come for a, a a miserly stroll out of the tunnel to touch the banner. They don't care. And you can, and all, and, uh, and everybody can go to Twitter. I don't care about any of that shit, man. I don't care about any of it. Show me what you do on game day. That's all that matters to me. Not what you tweet, not what you call into radio shows and say or don't say. Show me what you do on the field. And it's been pretty obvious for weeks now. This team's not interested in playing college football this year. Now, it could just be they've given up on the season. More than likely, they just don't believe in the coaches and the game plan. And and so the first time they face any adversity, they just implode. Whatever the rationale is, we don't know because we're not there. But, you know, do all your grandstanding you want. I don't give a frack about any of your talk. I just look at what you do in the games. And it's been obvious that this team's just not, this program's, just not serious about this. Now, what remains to be seen is why, and that will be the next phase of the conversation about whether Jim Harbaugh will remain the coach here for another year or not, but that's the next phase on our side. On your side, it's about what's going to happen in terms of the playoff and everything else. I don't I don't think there's any way you're being left out of the playoff. I think the question is, do you change the rules in order to put them in the championship game? And even that, I know as a Michigan fan, I'm supposed to get like all incensed for changing the rules to cater to the Buckeyes if they do that. Why? Why? Let's. I'm into keeping it real, Mark. You know that. Well, so Steve, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like what I'm about to say, but here's the truth. Yours is the only relevant program in our conference. The distance between you and the rest of the league right now is greater than the distance between Clemson and the rest of the ACC. The entire sport is about the playoff. Whether you like it or not is irrelevant. It is what it is. Okay? And that's the number one reason they're playing football this year, in my view, is so Ohio State can go to the playoff. So it makes total sense then that you would change the rules to help Ohio State go to the playoff. And any Michigan fan that doesn't like that, you know, you've had 15 Saturdays over Thanksgiving weekend recently to do a damn thing about it. And we didn't. So I don't see a need to get all worked up about something. In the end, stop letting them kick your ass and then talk. 
Go ahead. Uh, I see this understanding that I am so far removed from 1988, Ohio State's last losing season, four, six, and one, losing to Michigan, put up a good fight, down 20 to nothing, came back, took a lead. John Colasar, game winning touchdown pass in Columbus. But I still believe that if I were on your side of it, I want, would want to see the game play. I just really would. I, I just would. I also am going to state that it's just too bad that we've come to this place in college football where the college football playoff means that much. And it does. And you play for championships. But because it's an invitational, I discredit it as much as I possibly can. <laughs> now, see, the thing that I will say about that has become a bit of a blurred line, at least in regards to the way these games are canceled and the reporting of those cancellations where the first ones, at least in the Big Ten, that involved Wisconsin, it was clear to determine that the Big Ten had cleared those teams to play, but it was Wisconsin that made the choice not to play. Uh, certainly, we know that of Ohio State last weekend. This seems to be a bit vague in regards to whether the game did not meet Big Ten standards or Michigan is opting not to play. And, and the reason I point that out is that we have had a messy season. But we knew we were going to have a messy season, and I think everybody jumped in and said, okay, we're playing, especially in the Big Ten where there was a fight to play, mm -hmm. and that regardless of how messy it gets, we played at the conclusion of the season. Every football season involves games that are meaningless toward the ramifications of a championship, but the games are still played as scheduled. Now, I understand there are health considerations here, and if those are clearly not met by the, the, the conference's guidelines— I am fully on board, although I may not completely be on board with what those guidelines are. They're agreed upon. But I think competitors play, and if the game's on the schedule, you play if you meet the guidelines. So what happens, What what's the, because it's not a rivalry in my view. It is a tradition. Is it is the tradition of this game, is it over? Is it a thing of the past? Absolutely not. It still attracts the most eyes to the television screen, not maybe the number one game of the year every year, but consistently the number one game during a period of time. And Steve, you know the scores of these games and you know how competitive they've been. Having this conversation with you, and I'm sure we did the week of the Michigan-Ohio State game. Well, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. The Ohio State-Michigan game two years ago and this very week, we would have been in, it wasn't a narrative and now it's become this narrative of college football nation not the people that are invested in the game but you know your oregon fan or your usc fan that just knows okay ohio state kills michigan every year we know that that's going to happen well no that's not been the case and that's why it's still a rivalry it's been a butt kicking for two consecutive years yes ohio state's been winning the game but they've been competitive games other than the you know the tape 4 ca years a couple 37 to 7 and 42 10 games late in Jim Tressel's run. And then the last two years, you know, had we been having this conversation, and again, I'm sure we did two years ago, we're looking at Michigan as a four point favorite, having played better than Ohio State. And there's just, just been the two real butt kickings the last two years. This was a competitive game, regardless of Michigan showing up with a five and seven record. In 2014 against a would-be an eventual national championship team, still competitive games. So I'm sticking up for Michigan here, which is odd. But I, I I'm you know, sticking up with a rivalry. Yeah, I I, I think that I, I think that you are longing for a return to something that under the current regime at Michigan just isn't going to happen. And I mean, we we are debating within our own fan base and university community whether to continue subsidizing this abject failure, right? I mean, we're, we're having that debate right now. I, I don't believe this would be even debated. Whether the guy was a Heisman Trophy finalist, took your program to the Rose Bowl, what have you, I just, I don't believe you could survive at Ohio State. What was Cooper? 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93? So, yeah, he started 0-6 too, right? Didn't yeah, win his first game until 94, is that right? Am I doing that right? That he didn't win his first game against Michigan until 1994? There was the tremendous um, tie victory in 92. The so, 92. Oh, five, okay. Yes, didn't win the game for six years. Okay. Yeah. But, but he never had six straight losses, though, right? Never no. six straight losses. We've had six straight losses, and the scores are getting worse and worse. And I, I, I just, 
I can't take this more seriously than my favorite team does, Mark. I just don't think they take it seriously. And again, you can tell me what you want to say all you want. I'm not 25, and I don't really care what the hell some social media ratio thinks. I'm almost 50 years old, so I'm not easily moved off my opinions, especially when they're based off of what I can actually see. And what I've seen on game day is against Ohio State, first sign of adversity, quit. And what I saw this year was that exact same thing. So people can tweet out all the defiant messages they want, and they can have their press avail that they're hosting at the time you and I are taping this. Lottie freaking da. In the end, it's about results on the field, period. And that's those, I think, just speak for themselves, Mark. So what do you do as a Michigan fan going forward, even if you dismiss this game? This game is the culmination of a season. You can't dismiss your seasons and you're stuck. You're trapped in a division with this juggernaut as it stands right now. So even the games leading up to the game or what used to be the game in your eyes become. It's a just a game. Extent. It's just a game. Yeah. OK, but then the, 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 the games leading up to the game in Columbus or Ann Arbor become meaningless to a certain extent, because why do you play games? You play games to determine a champion. That's right. I don't disagree. That's why I'm ecstatic. Now, you just explained why I am, maybe ecstatic's not the right word. I am relieved. I was relieved last Saturday to get up and not have a Michigan football game on because I can't stop watching. Now, this one is different because Ohio State has just has done this too. But on a macro level, I can't stop watching. And so when I got up Saturday and there wasn't a game, I felt like the local meth addict who found out in, 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 a, in a small town, who found out the one meth dealer just got uh, busted by the cops. You're like, <sighs> like I knew I wasn't going to be able to avoid going to him for some meth today. And now it's not an option. So I kind of feel free to go about the rest of my day. I, I, really, I really enjoyed not having a Michigan football game last week. There's, there's two options we Michigan fans have. One is become a slappy, denial, circular, self-pleasuring squads, pump smoke up your keisters. That's one option. Okay, and I, I don't begrudge anybody for choosing either option. We all have our own coping mechanisms. Okay, but one is, well, you know, this could have been like the greatest upset in the history of uh, the, the rivalry. Okay, that's one option. The other option is just go dark, gallows humor, black humor, nihilism. I'm on that road, and, I, and I'm, that's the road I'm on right now. Mark. Because you do it well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to being disappointed. Right. All right. Anything else, brother? Good luck to you guys the rest of the way. You, you, not that you needed our help, uh, you know, and I guess you'll just have to play Maryland or somebody and see if you can pad your resume against them Saturday. Well, I did fail to look up what I believe is an 86 nothing game to be the worst drubbing in the history of the series on the Michigan side. Uh, I believe that's the score. Uh, but, yeah, Ohio State, you had brought up the Big Ten situation revolving uh, it involving the championship scenario and whether the Big Ten will step in, change its rules, which I think is, again, just I can't believe that they were that short-sighted knowing that games were going to be canceled and that we could – it's actually worked out better than it could have. You could have, you could have uh, the top two teams in one of the two divisions be ineligible and like a three and four team be going to a championship game. So, anyway – Regardless, I don't think the college football playoff committee is going to get that hung up on whether it's an Indiana game or uh, Ohio State uh, Northwestern, I should say, or Ohio State Wisconsin Iowa winner as the two seed. It's a it's a pretty comparable opponent, and they're going to pick who they think are the four best teams. And, and so I think it's inconsequential from that standpoint. The the ardent traditionalist in me wants to win Big Ten championships, even though people just generally out there don't care about conference championships anymore which i think is horrible but uh, for me yeah we we need to catch michigan on that uh list as well so let's get us a conference championship you will I, michigan will ever you and i will not live to see them ever win another big 10 championship i firmly believe that i really do so you're gonna catch us in that too mark good to see you as always man thanks for joining us steve we appreciate it you bet more michigan podcast in a moment We get asked all the time here on Michigan Podcast, hey, what can we do to support you guys? Well, you can support us via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. You don't just support us, you get exclusive content there, including handicapping picks, exclusive podcasts, and other things available to you by supporting us on our Patreon page. And who knows, you might make some money. Uh, It looks like all my NFL season win total best bets 
are going to cash this year. So check us out, patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And thanks to the hundreds of you that are supporting us right now at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. This week's Twitter poll, we asked you what should be Michigan's expectations for Jim Harbaugh. Just breathe a lot. You know, don't suck it in. You need oxygen. Just breathe a lot. 10% of you thought that that was a good enough expectation. I mean, just breathe. Be better than OJ. Like, don't slit anybody's throats. Don't murder anybody. 5.9% of you thought that that was a good standard. The other 94.1% of you thought that was probably too much to ask is don't kill people. I, I get it. You know, these are tough times. The option of staying meth free was presented. You know, just stay meth. Don't do meth. 14% of you said... We like that standard. The other 86% said, I don't know. I mean, watching Michigan football this year, I've tried to do some meth. It's, it's, It's caused me to at least contemplate it. The most popular answer was hold Ohio State under 80. 70% of you said that's a good standard. That's that's the right expectation for Jim Harbaugh. Well, given the time of year, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. Jim Harbaugh is not only going to hold Ohio State under 80 this year, he's going to hold them scoreless or something this year. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode. No question of the week because we didn't ask me anything. I don't know if we're going to have an episode or not next week. We shall see if we come up with something. Maybe Michigan will come up with something. It will probably disappoint. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, whichever you prefer, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube. However you access the show, please. Like, share, rate, subscribe, five-star review. The more of those that uh, those of you that do that, the more it helps us to find more suffering Michigan fans just like us. Until the next time, Merry Christmas to all of you. I'm Steve Dace, and go blue.